Okay, so we're glad to have Tom Graber, who I've known basically as long as I've been a mass as I've been a mathematician in training, even, and he's going to tell us about virtual localization for relative obstruction theories and stable log maps. Okay, thanks, Ravi. It's fun to be in your uh, virtual seminar here. Um, so yeah, so I want to talk. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing. I haven't finished writing this paper. Um, I've been talking about this for a few years. Um, but the, and it's, the goal is just a very technical statement, which is kind of to update the first paper that I ever wrote, which was like 20 years ago about um, how to do torus localization for um, perfect obstruction theories, and in particular for the ordinary space of stable maps. Um, and so in recent years, there's been interest in this kind of logarithmic stable maps, um, where some kind of generalization, and I kind of expected that that old theorem would still work there, but it doesn't. Um, and there's kind of a technical issue that I'll explain. Um, and there's kind of interesting, um, some interesting mathematics that comes up both for kind of generalizing kind of the general theorem about localization of virtual classes and the kind of a relative setting, and also in the particular application to stable log maps. So I'm probably gonna mostly talk about the first half of that, um, which is the part that I, I really understand about as well as I want to at this point. Um, and for the application to actually calculating things for spatial log maps, there's still things, there's some things which I think I'll never understand, but even the things that I want to understand, there's still a little work for me left to do. Let me see if I can scroll this. Thing. Okay, so, ah, okay. I knew I would, I should have done more technical tests before starting. <laughs> okay, what if I go like this? Uh, What the hell? This is kind of like doing a Blackboard talk where you have one Blackboard. Sorry. Yeah, and it's already written on and you can't erase it. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Okay, so here's my plan. So first I want to talk about just the classical um, localization. This kind of goes back to work of bot. Um, and just the background on how equivariant child groups and there'll be one maybe maybe new thing. I don't know, I haven't seen it anywhere else. It's useful for me um, to kind of express that old um, theory in terms of something like segregate classes of cones. Um, and the second part, we talk about the fixed stack of a torus action. So this is also kind of cool. It's something I should have learned 20 years ago, but I only learned it now. There's some kind of uh, exotic phenomenon that happened when you look at trying to make sense of fixed points when a torus is acting not on a scheme, but on a stack. Um, then I'll talk about virtual classes and kind of the main theorem. And lastly, I'll try to see how much time is left to talk about what happens for log stable maps. And there you start to see this kind of combinatorics of tropical curves. and um, these kind of cycle classes that are related to the double ramification cycle and some kind of refinements that are kind of popular now if you go to Rahul's seminar um, online. Okay, but so let me start with, with the background. So this goes back to a theorem of uh, Raoul Bott from the 1950s, I think, um, and I'll state it in algebraic geometry, but in his theorem, he was working in kind of a differential geometric setting. Um, that's not so important, I don't think. So um, the statement would be that if I start with some smooth projective variety that has a torus action, oh, let me just write this. So T, where is it? So T always is gonna be a torus and that just means for me here, you know, GM to the R. And really uh, for today's talk, I'm always basically gonna take it to be GM because it'll simplify some of my notations. So every T is just a one dimensional uh, torus. Okay. Now, or for bot, it would have been a circle. Okay, it would have been S1 acting on, on some, oh, Let's remind me tomorrow. Okay. Um, okay, so you have uh, your smooth effective variety, you've got this torus action on it, and you have a vector bundle. Um, and I'm going to need that thing to be a T equivalent vector bundle. So T is acting on X, and you kind of lift it to act on the, the total space of this, this vector bundle. And the setup is you want to compute some integral over X of some maybe polynomial in the churn classes of V. So I mean, I didn't write. So as an example here, let's see, can I give myself a little room? I mean, the one I tend to think about is if the rank of E was equal to dimension of my X, I could just try to compute the top churn class of E and that would give me some number. But, you know, I could look at something like P might be something like C1 squared times C7. You know, if, if I'm on a nine dimensional variety, I can take any polynomial I want in those churn classes. Um, and then if the degree of that polynomial is equal to the dimension of X, I can try and compute this integral, integral over X of that, that P. And um, what Bott's theorem tells you is that you can replace this integral over the entire variety X by just an integral over the set of fixed points of T. So those points that don't move under the action of the torus. 
And what you integrate there uh, is it's an explicit formula. It's kind of complicated to say it directly. Later on in this talk, I'll have some kind of concise notation that hides that complexity, but, but it's a real thing. There's some kind of combinatorics out, you know, some kind of algebra to extract this formula. But let me tell you what it depends on. That's the, that's the key point. So um, the thing you need to know to compute this thing on the fixed points is you take your bundle E and you restrict it to the, to the fixed set. Okay, and now, um, I don't know if everybody does this all the time, so I've spent a long time thinking about it, but if you have a, on, the, on XT, you know, the torus is not acting, okay, it's not doing anything, but it's still acting on E, so it's acting fiber-wise. So I have this bundle over X, and at each point of X, my torus is acting on that fiber, which is a vector space, so I get a linear representation of the torus. And, you know, GM, that's the one group whose representation theory I'm really on top of, so every finite dimensional representation, you know, it splits, Okay, is a direct sum of irreducibles. And those irreducibles are, are indexed by the integers. Okay, the torus can act on a, on a one-dimensional vector space with some weight, you know, t acts by t to the r, or t to the i, I guess, in my terminology here. So I can take that, you know, each fiber splits into these kind of eigenspaces, these weight spaces. I look at every copy of that i weight thing and I get some, and those fit together to form bundles. So the whole bundle E over the fixed slope is splits into a direct sum of these eigenbundles or, or weight bundles indexed by the integers. So this is a sum over, sorry, over I and Z. Of course, only finitely many weights are, are gonna occur. So I get those, those bundles EI. So that's one thing I need to know. Uh, if I wanna tell you what's this integral I do, I need to know not only E restricted to the fixed locus, but each of these EIs are some separate bundles that are restricted to the fixed point. So I need to know those weights, those integers I that occur and the bundles associated to them. And then I need to do the same thing to the tangent bundle. So, you know, for the E, that was just some random vector bundle on X, the data of how T acts on it, that's some extra piece of information that may or may not even exist. So you may not, some bundles may not have a, a you know, T equivariant structure um, and you need to pick one. But the tangent bundle comes naturally. You know, of course, the, the torus is acting on X, it's acting on the tangent bundle. And so I can, again, I can do the same thing. I can restrict that tangent bundle of X to this fixed set. Um, I can decompose it into these weight spaces. And there's one fact about that decomposition that you need to know, um, which is that of course, you know, T again, T is acting, sorry, T is now meaning both tangent space and torus. That's the risk of the subject. Um, so I look here and of course the tangent acts trivially on XT. So it acts trivially on the tangent space to XT. Okay, so that is gonna be, if I look at the weight zero piece, so I take this TX and I decompose it into these um, eigenbundles. And there's a special one there, which is the zero weight piece, which also sometimes is called TXF for fixed. Okay, so the fixed part of that action. And that's exactly the tangent space to the, to the fixed locus. So again, I think the thing that's totally clear is that um, TXT is contained in this. The torus acts trivially on that, on that tangent bundle, but there's no other directions that are fixed. Okay, so this is closely related to the important fact, which I don't think I wrote here, which is that um, XT is smooth. So did I write it maybe down below? No, I didn't. Okay, so this XT um, is smooth. And you know, in some sense, the reason is that locally, um, in the R fixed point, the action of the torus on X, on the smooth variety X, looks like a linear representation of T. Okay, and the fixed locus of a linear representation T is exactly the fixed, you know, those, those irreducible, some of the um, irreducible parts, so it's the fixed part. Um, okay, and so the normal bundle of XT in X is just the rest. It's the sum of all the other weights. Uh, I put a little M to be moving, okay? So um, that's this piece. And so what I need to do is I need to do this calculation over the fixed set. I need to know these churn classes of these bundles EI and same thing for these, uh, again, the notation gets area. I need to take this normal bundle. So this moving part, I need to know the churn classes of the different weight pieces of that. And again, it's important that none of those weights are zero um, to just be able to write down the, the correct formula. Um, you have to divide by some weights. Okay, so that's, that's what Bott's theorem is. He tells you exactly how to write down this polynomial and he tells you exactly um, you, that you get this identity of, of numbers at, at the end, these two, um, these two things. And so this can be a powerful tool. Um, can you, you trade in some complexity? Again, there's a formula that I've hidden that's in this box. It's maybe some complicated expression in these weights and these different term classes. But um, the fixed locus may be much smaller than X. So the strongest place to use this is when your torus acts with like isolated fixed points. So like you have the torus action on projective space and only fixes kind of the coordinate points. And then this just turns into a finite sum. There's no churn class of bundles. All you need to do is calculate these weights 
at those fixed points. And so you get sort of combinatorial expressions for, for integrals over, over big spaces. Okay, so that's this theorem. You can, and again, it's just an explicit theorem about integration, but there's a nice way to understand it and to prove it. I mean, so of course, Bot had a nice proof. We used, you know, just, just, just kind of localize the, literally an integral. I use this integral symbol. It's, it's almost like a joke in my mind, which is as a degree of a, of a cycle. But you know, he was actually calculating integrals and you can kind of localize them near the fixed set. Um, but there's another way to think about this in terms of equivariant cohomology, um, or you know, just because I know the ropes a little better, I'll talk about it in terms of equivariant Chow groups, um, which really kind of, I don't know, it gives you a framework to think about what's going on. It also, like I said, it gives you a nice language to write down the formulas. And um, you know, my goal is somehow in this talk to talk about doing some integrals over spaces that aren't smooth. Okay, so the smoothness in it is an essential hypothesis here. And it gives you at least a way to kind of set up that problem and see that you should expect some answers and kind of a, a path to start trying to prove it. Okay, so I want to explain what happens in the So is, is there just as a maybe a side question, what, what, like where is you, so is this nicely written down? Is this is like where should people be pointed to look at? Look like oh, if you want to look at this? So, I mean, you can look at Bot's original paper to see the argument, but to see the relation to equivalent cohomology, there's a beautiful paper of Atia and Bot um, where they, uh, where they show how to recover that from the equivariant cohomology. And they also do this cool thing where they show this principle of stationary phase. And it's called something like equivariant cohomology in the moment map. That was, was one of my favorite papers that I read in grad school. Um, so I, yeah, I recommend that one. I remember, they, I, I, yeah, I, I, remember that, I really like that one too. But, but you're saying that it's better to do that and not anything. And then just sort of in your mind's eye, just do it for equivariant chow. Oh, so if you want to, so the, I mean, well, I mean I'll talk about the equivariant chow next. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, the reference for that that I know is this paper of Ed and Graham, uh, where they prove it. I don't know other right. places maybe to look. Probably a good reference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's see. So yeah. So I want to, I want to now, I guess the thing that's new here is this is any scheme X, so X doesn't have to be smooth anymore, and I have a I have a torus acting on it again, um, and then so following kind of an idea of Bertotaro, um, Edin and Graham construct these equivariant Chow groups of X. So I, well, that's not something I expect everyone to know. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick. I'm not going to tell you what these are, but I'll tell you what's their properties and how to think about them, maybe um, for the purposes of this talk. So they're a lot like the ordinary child groups of X. They have basically the same kind of formal properties. So if you know intersection theory, um, you can do all the things you expect. But again, they only apply when your X comes with an action of this torus. And so the functorial that is you have are for equivariant maps. Okay, so you can do a proper push forward or flat pullback or these Gizen pullbacks. Any of those things work as long as your maps are equivariant with respect to this torus action. And you have churn classes for vector bundles, again, provided they have this lift of the T action. So T is acting on, on your bundle. Um, those kind of functoriality properties, just like in Fulton's book, they'll give rise to an intersection product if your X is smooth. Okay, so look at these chunk groups, there's a, there's a product. Um, so all this is something that looks exactly the same. Um, and sorry, another thing you wanna know at the end, I'm gonna do these manipulations in equivariant chow, um, but the problem you might be interested in at the start is like that in that bot, um, theorem is like an ordinary intersection number that happens here. So you can compare what happens in equivariant cohomology or equivariant child groups to ordinary ones by a specialization map. There's a map here where you forget that your thing has a torus action and you can, uh, you can get back an ordinary cycle class. Um, and then the last thing that where you start to see some kind of novelty and something that's really different in the subject, which is if I just do this, of course, the torus acts on a point. Okay, that's, uh, that's not hard. Um, and if I look at the child group there, what I get is not just, so I'm always gonna work with Q coefficients. I, I won't say it, but I'm always gonna do that to avoid difficulties. Um, what I get here is Q join lambda. And this lambda is sitting in co-dimension one. Okay, so uh, did I write, some, I think I wrote something more here. Uh, no, I didn't, let me, so I'm just saying basically that for any I, if I look at this kind of A, uh, let's see, negative I, uh, T of a point, this is equal to Q times some class lambda to the high. There's this generator, it's kind of sitting in dimension negative one. And so you take powers of it and it gets more and more negative dimensional. Um, and those things are the, are the whole thing. So that's, that's the thing that's maybe frightening and unsettling when you first see um, the current cohomology, but that's gonna turn out to be the great thing for us is this, this ring here. And so it implies in particular, since any variety comes an equivariant map to a point, you know, via this kind of basic functoriality, 
you can pull back this, you know, these kind of intersection, these child classes from a point and multiply them by things on X. And it tells you that this, this equivalent child groups of X, they always have this structure of a module over this, this remaining fluid joint angle. Okay, so um, that's kind of sitting in the background of the entire theory, this, this ring. And what the localization theorem says then is that if I look at, I have any X, any scheme X, and maybe finite type over field, okay. And I have some torus section on it. And then I look at the inclusion map from the fixed set into X. So I should say one important thing is that even for pretty bad X, this X, this fixed locus of a torus section is always closed. So this is always a closed embedding. It's a proper map so I can push forward along it. Um, and that map is an isomorphism once you invert lambda. So in other words, if I look at this map, this is a map of modules over Q adjoin lambda. I tensor with Q adjoin one over lambda, sorry, Q adjoin lambda comma one over lambda. Um, and then this map is, a, is an isomorphism. Okay. So that's kind of an abstract statement. Um, so I guess usually I'll put a little sub lambda here to denote that localization. Okay. So this is the map that's an, that's an isomorphism. Um, Okay, so that's that seems innocent enough. What does this have to do with the um, the Bott residue theorem? Um, so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to think about this. I have um, what, am, what did I write here? Holy shit. Uh, da, da, da. So if I have any class alpha, okay, in the in the child group here, if I push it forward and I pull it back, um, there's this because I'm in the smooth setting. So again, Bott residue isn't when X is smooth. So I push forward and I pull back. And even in this equivariant setting, that just amounts to intersecting my class alpha with the top term class of this vector bundle, okay, the normal bundle here. So I push forward and I pull back and, and I get that. Um, and so that this is an equality that's holding inside this, uh, sorry, I still forgot the, uh, actually this is still true. I don't need to localize to say this, okay. Um, and so, and then here's that key fact. Again, I told you, the, if I look at that normal bundle of the fixed locus, all the weights Okay, of the torus action, I think are non-zero. And I'm just gonna tell you this, it's not super hard, but um, I'm not explaining it. The other class, that top turn class, that's invertible in this ring. Once I invert lambda, I'll also invert um, this thing E of n. Okay, so I can write down explicitly actually the, the inverse. So if I look at this class alpha, this is one over the Euler class here. Then when I push that forward and pull it back, I'm gonna get the fundamental class XT. Okay, because I'll just get E times E inverse. And what that means, of course, that's the same thing I would get if I pulled back the fundamental class of X. If I pull the fundamental class back, um, I always get the fundamental class. And since there's a unique class, you know, because this map up here was an isomorphism, there's a unique class here that pushes forward to the fundamental class on this side. And so we've just solved for it, okay, by doing this little exercise. We see that this alpha that pushes forward to the fundamental class of X must be exactly this class, okay? And we can write this out. Again, to write out this kind of more explicitly, I'll, maybe I'll wait until the very end here. But, um, and then what? Then the last trick I can do here, the, where we finally get to some statement on integrals, is trying to integrate, you know, some this polynomial over x, and we can write that as p cap the fundamental class of x. That's now the push forward of this alpha, and then you can use here the the projection formula. Okay, so it's like it's the one little piece of intersection theory we need to finish this off projection formula says if I want to cap some cohomology class against the push forward, it's the same as pulling back the cohomology class and then capping it against the, the original thing. Okay, so this um, is happening on XT. And so and when I pull back P, P is like some in terms of the I ever start P is going to be a I'm going to get this one right here. We're having brief sound and challenges there. I don't maybe know. this was practice something happened. Oh, yeah, I seem to be having aha. My computer is struggling under the difficulty of this calculation. Um, the computer is happening. Maybe I should just say this. If I look, <laughs> if I look at the um, Chow ring of the fixed locus, okay. So again, one, this is another key point. If I have, if my torus is acting trivially on something, I, I don't get some new exciting uh, ring, okay, or it's new associate groups. This is just the ordinary child groups uh, of XT tensor with Q adjoined lambda. Okay, so all I get here are kind of polynomials and lambda whose coefficients are child classes 
on uh, xt. Or, you know, if I invert lambda, I get like Laurent polynomials in lambda um, whose coefficients are, are chosen. So everything that I read over here is just, this is just some complicated way to write down some um, kind of rational function in lambda whose coefficients are, are child classes. And I'm just gonna read off the, the degree zero piece and in, in integrated here. So this really does turn into some totally explicit formula um, for how to do integrals over X in terms of integrals on the fixed set. And for what goes for me, let me just, let me just pick out what was the key point. Um, we had to find this class alpha that pushed forward to the fundamental class of X. Okay, and once I do that, then projection formula says, Instead of x, I can I can use this alpha, which is living on the fixed locus. Okay, I can reduce my thing here, and again I pick this up because later I'm going to want to instead of integrating in getting grand winning theory or in lots of different enumerative theories, one doesn't want to pair cohomology classes against a fundamental class, but rather against some virtual virtual fundamental class. So there I'd like to find something on the fixed locus that pushes forward to that that virtual class. Okay, and the, the kind of abstract localization theorem of Edin and Graham guarantees there exists some unique class supported on the fixed locus. Um, that does that. And so it's just a question of finding it. Okay. And so when your thing is smooth, um, this kind of self-intersection formula lets you spot it and identify it as this inverse Euler class. Uh, in general, I don't think we know that much about how to, um, how to calculate, you know, an alpha that does this, but I, mean, I was just going to say one thing about it, um, which is useful here for, for what I'm going to do. So first, just some terminology. Um, if I look at this map, you know, the <laughs> that theorem tells me I have this inverse to the um, push forward. So I'll just call it, I guess I didn't see it here. So sometimes I'll, I don't know, I'm not gonna need this name. Maybe I'll, I'll call it the residue map. Um, takes me from equivalent cohomology of the whole space to equivalent cohomology of the fixed locus, maybe with inverting this lambda, that's this, this inverse. And I wanna say we can calculate this thing in terms of something kind of like segre classes using deformation to the normal cone. Um, so let me, so if you know deformation to the normal cone, then this should be really easy. And if you don't, then you should just ignore this little section. Um, so if I look at this. Um, so it's maybe, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe I was not paying attention at some point when I was confused about something, but is, uh, yeah. I've lost our, so X is no longer smooth now? What was your? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, I never said that. I never said that, yes, exactly. So, I mean, X could be smooth, but yeah, I want to, I want to take a break here and I want to go back to the general setting. So if X is singular, I'd like to just say one last thing about the structure of this map and how you might try to calculate it. Um, or but, think but, it. But, but the residue formula is in some sense only known in the smooth case. So it's like, a, but you're trying to make sense. Well, it's not known, in this, uh, but it's originally in the smooth case. And so you're trying to make sense of what it could be. And then- yeah. oh, Yes, I want to push, push forward into unknown territory of uh, singular, uh, singular yeah. schemes. Yes, but but the that residue theorem up here. Sorry, this theorem. Let me, let me go back up. Uh, this localization theorem. This is known for any x. I mean, that's ah. the nice thing, and it's really easy. I mean, right. So, so this theorem holds theorem. for any x. It doesn't have any particularities. Right. So localization. Yes. This theorem, is a totally general theorem. It's the only getting from there to bot res. Right. So the issue with smoothness is not at all localization. It's only getting to there to bot residue. That's the issue you're saying. Okay. Great. Yes, I guess so. I, I mean, yes, in, in, the, in the language I'm using in this talk, although often people, when they talk about localization, they include that, that formula. You know, they talk about being able to do integrals. Um, but yes, absolutely. So this thing is always true. And again, the point is, you just want to, to turn that into an explicit formula. You need to find this class that pushes forward to the fundamental class. Okay? And when it's smooth, you do that using this self-intersection formula. When it's singular, well, I'll just tell you what I can say about it um, in general, and then we'll talk about um, Something else. Okay, so, um, so yeah, if you wanted to calculate this, one thing you could do is um, you could do the deformation to the normal cone. Okay, and if you're, you know, this, if x, if a torus is acting on x, you know, you do this deformation to the normal cone by like blowing up xt, that's a torus invariant subset. So the torus acts on this whole thing. You can do this whole thing torus equivariantly. And so you can factor this map, you know, this residue map that goes from cohomology of X or equivalent cohomology of X to that of the fixed locus, it's going to factor through this kind of standard special specialization map from X to the normal cone here. So there's this kind of, again, this is, this is how Fulton intersection theory works, um, is you make extensive use of, of this map. You factor this restriction through, um, through here. And again, formal properties are going to guarantee you that this residue map, you know, of course, there's a residue map here, okay? The torus is acting on this normal cone, Okay. And just like in the case of the normal bundle, um, there's sort of no fixed part other than xt. So the fixed locus of the torus action on the normal cone 
okay, of xt and x is just xt. So again, you're going to get that the um, you know that you have a an isomorphism of, of uh, Echovarian Chow groups here, and you can look at this inverse of, of, the, of the push forward. So to make sure I'm following, so you can write it. So to make sure I'm following so so far, uh, uh, using your language of before the localization formula, yeah. like is still good, and if you could solve this and do it, get like a residue formula here, then you'd get the bot right? like that. Then you'd have bot, but you you've reduced the problem but not solved it to this cone case. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, instead of doing it for an arbitrary, you know, x embedded in xt embedded in x, you can do it just for xt embedded in these cones. And in some sense, that's what happened in that little proof I quickly sketched about residue, the self-intersection formula. The whole point is that somehow any smoothing inside any other smoothing locally, it looks like the smoothing inside the, the normal the normal bundle has the zero section. So you just do the calculation there and you get that. Um, that's how you prove that self-intersection formula usually is by this kind of reduction to the normal cone. Um, okay, and so what's the advantage here? I mean, I, I just turned one localization calculation into another. And I don't know that the advantage is that big in general, but there's one way you might uh, go about then trying to calculate this, again, sort of by analogy with what happened before, is if that cone, so I'll just use C to mean this, this normal cone, although you could do it for any cone now. Um, if you have C embedded into some vector bundle, okay, which that's a normal thing to do to cones that it's kind of like taking a resolution of some sheaf by a locally free sheaf. So they tend to admit these. If you have an equivariant embedding like this, well, then you can just calculate, um, you know, if I wanted to see what's the class that pushes forward to this um, class of fundamental class of the cone, okay, uh, I can look at the restriction of C. Well, I can just write it like this. I mean, I can, I can think of C sitting inside this vector bundle. I can pull back to the zero section of a vector bundle, and I just get this explicit formula that the, um, this residue map, this inverse of the push forward applied to C, it's the inverse Euler class of V cap, um, sort of the, uh, the pullback of this class C in, under the zero section, okay? Um, so this is just a formula and it defines some, some class associated to C. And I, I say this is like segregate classes because if my torus is GM and my action on this C is just the usual scaling action, okay? Then I can embed it in a vector bundle and use the usual scaling action there. And you'll get that this thing that I call this um, residue of C, um, again, that's gonna be some Laurent polynomial and lambda. So it's just some classes times some powers of lambda. And when you get there are exactly the segregate classes of C. Okay, so this is, um, this is easy to see. Basically, this is easy to prove because this formula is in Folden's book, okay? In the case where um, the action is the standard, is the standard action and it's, it's written in, um, so, in ordinary so calculus. So at this point, like, so, okay, so a cone is going to be something like graded, it's spec of a graded ring instead of prod or a graded ring. And if you've got this gadget, which produces a spec grade class so far, and that's for, and, uh, and that, okay, great. And you um, didn't yeah. use properness anywhere on this, on the localization theorem? No, there's no properness that you need. You don't even need separatedness. It's great. Uh, you know, sometimes you need some of those things later. If you want to turn it into a formula about integration, to integrate, you might need properness or something. But the localization theorem is very general. And it's nice that you don't need properness because again, you can just look. And if I want to know, typically, I mean, I kind of hide this in the notation, but you know, the fixed locus has many components of different dimension. And you like to just kind of study them one at a time. And the point is you can just, if you want to study just one of them, you can just delete the other components of the fixed locus and you still got a perfectly nice space with torus action. And now only one piece is there to con contribute. So you can, you can identify those things one at a time. They don't kind of interact with each other in, in any way. Um, so yeah, that's a great thing about the, um, the theory. Okay, and so um, again, the reason why I said this, this stuff about the segregate class point of view and this kind of residue map is um, later on when I want to prove my theorem, um, I'll be in situations where the, localization theorem doesn't apply. So again, this, but I can just take this as a definition of some kind of a segregate class of a cone. And that makes sense even for cone stacks, okay? Which um, if you, you know, if you've studied, if you tried to read these papers about, you know, how to define virtual class and stuff, it's all about embedding cones in vector bundles or more generally cone stacks inside vector bundle stacks. And this formula makes sense in that setting. So given a cone that emits some embedding into a cone stack, you can define some kind of segregate, generalized segregate classes of that cone just by this formula. Okay, so here there, here it does not agree with some equivalent residue um, because there's no, um, you know, that localization theorem as stated is not true for Arden stacks, um, but th this thing still makes sense. It still gives you some kind of uh, way to associate to a cone, some classes on the base that um, somehow have a similar flavor to this equivalent residues. Okay, 
Okay, and, and so just to demystify cone stacks, like if a vector bundle, you might mod, if you have a vector bundle, you can mod yeah, out by the scaling, and then that can act on something. You're like quotioning a cone by a vector bundle. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mean, yes, I mean, and the, the vector bundle stack, if I just have a map between two vector bundles, maybe E0 to E1, I can look at like E1 modulo, the additive action of E0, and that's some kind of a stack. Um, is there, we, 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 I was trying to, this last quarter, uh, like, is there these notion of Picard, what do they call it? Picard stacks? That, yeah, right. I never kind of know what that word is about, but I think it's just these. <laughs> I try to interpret what that actually, like, to make precise what they were, and I yeah. understand Barbara and Techie telling me what the right thing to do. I got very confused, uh, but uh, okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah no, they, they're very confusing, actually. I mean, they kind of look pretty innocent uh, until you start, it's better not to think too hard about them. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then they're fine. And again, a cone stack would just be, you know, inside the C1, you might have some cone. It's invariant under the action of E0. And then you could take that quotient. And it would be a cone stack living inside a vector bundle stack. And then I'd like to write down this formula for it. Okay. Um, and, and, I, so, and that's a class. Again, the thing is not totally obvious here. That's a class that depends only on the cone and not which vector bundle you, you embedded it in. Okay. okay. So now there's going to be a digression here. Um, cause I'm going to want to talk about the fixed stack up above. I was always talking about a torus acting on a scheme and you look at the fixed locus and uh, I never said anything about what that is because we all know what a fixed locus of a group action is. And I thought that I knew that for stacks too, but I really didn't. Um, some, even though I've thought about group actions on stacks for like 20 years, uh, I had really never understood this correctly. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about, um, how you're supposed to think about the fixed stack of a group action on, on a stack. So quickly, if it's a scheme, if I have T acting on a scheme X, um, then I mean, there's different ways you can think about what that fixed locus is. I can just take, as long as I'm over maybe a algebraic ghost field, I can just look at each element of my torus, each point, and it acts, gives me a map from X to itself. And I look at the intersection of the locus where all those different maps are equal to the identity map. So it's like some, what is it? Is it a co-equalizer, equalizer, anyway. Um, from that point of view, you might be worried that if X was not separated, this thing wouldn't be closed. Um, but because T is connected, it, it still is. Um, but you know, if we want to talk about this construction for stacks, of course, it's nice to think about the functor of points, think about what are maps to the fixed locus. Okay, so if I have, um, if I look at the fixed locus, what's a map from a scheme to that? Well, the whole point is if I, if I map from S to the fixed locus, the torus doesn't do anything to the fixed locus. So that gives me a map, which is T equivariant. You know, I can think about S. You know, given any scheme S, I can think of it as a T scheme, as a scheme with a T action by letting T act trivially. And then if I want to give an equivariant map from that thing to X, that's just the same as mapping X to the fixed set, right? If it acts trivially here, it better act trivially wherever it maps to. Okay, so that's the functor of points. A map to the fixed stack is a T equivariant map from your thing to X. Okay, and so that makes sense. And so you could, there's a nice paper of uh, Romagny where he just works out what's the analog then for, for a stack. So if I have X, is a stack with a T action. So I'm gonna hide the fact that it's actually a little bit confusing to decide what that means. Okay, what, what's that action of a group on a stack? I'm, there's only so much <laughs> I can say here. So we'll grant that that makes sense. Um, then you wanna define the fixed stack to be the thing where the kind of, you know, the S value points of this fixed stack are just T equivariant maps from S to X. Okay, again, we, and now I will, however, say what I mean by a T equivariant map of stacks. So what, again, what's a T equivariant map of schemes? It's like a di you have S to X and that induces this diagram. You get T cross S, okay. So I hate, you get this square and you want that thing to commute. Okay, that's what it means for a map to be T equivariant of like schemes or sets. And of course for stacks, usually you don't wanna ask a square to commute. You wanna choose a two morphism between the two things. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. Okay, a T equivariant map is gonna be a map from S to X plus, okay, plus an arrow like this that makes the thing commute. And this, this arrow needs to satisfy some properties, which I will not spell out now, but maybe in examples, I'll show you the flavor of them, okay? So there's some, some bigger diagrams that have to two commute, okay, once you put this, this square. Okay, so that's, that's what the fixed stack is. And, and so I feel like all the danger for me, like guessing there's a double arrow in there, I'd say like, of course, I may put two of them there. And, and <laughs> needs to satisfy properties is exactly where I said, like, here there be Yeah, yes, so, yeah. Um, and anyway, so let me just, yeah, <laughs> it is dangerous. Like, I always thought this was kind of dumb, but it's actually really cool. Okay, I'll just, there's, if you want to learn about stacks and you're looking for some little exercises to think about, I strongly recommend thinking about um, 
this stuff, although it gets complicated fast. But anyway, the key point here that I want to emphasize is that if I look at the map from the fixed stack to X, it's not a monomorphism. It's not going to be just a closed subscheme in general, because again, up here, the set of maps from S to XT, it's just a subset of the set of maps from S to X, right? Being TF covariant is a property, it's some condition on a map, but here being TF covariant is an extra piece of data in addition to the map. Okay, so the map from XT to X um, doesn't have to be closed, doesn't even have to be one-to-one -one, um, if there's more than one choice of this arrow that, that you could put there. Um, however, let me just say, if T is a torus and it's acting on a Lee Mumford stack, this XT is a closed substack. Okay, so um, did, did you already say that it's that uh, in general it's a, it's an algebraic stack? No, I didn't say that, and uh, for good reason. Yeah, it's not always an algebraic stack. Um, I was gonna say that as a surprise for later on. <laughs> but yeah, so um, yeah, so let me give some examples. So again, if you want to think about any construction for stacks, at least for me, there's two classes of stacks I like to think about. There's moduli stacks and there's quotient stacks. So I just want to give an example of each kind of how this definition plays out. So if I look at MG to be the stack of nodal curves, like pre-stable curves. So again, when, when your thing is Deline Mumford, this is pretty much behaves like you expect. There's one kind of weird thing that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, but for Arden stacks, when you have positive dimensional stabilizers, then there's something really different. Um, and you see that here right away. So if I let T act trivially on this thing, okay? So I just look at the trivial action. Um, then if I look at the fixed stack, so MGT, what that amounts to is it's a flat family, you know, MGS parameterizes flat families and nodal curves. This thing parameterizes flat families and nodal curves with an action of T on the fibers. Okay, so that action could be trivial. Okay, so of course, what I expect and what I believed really before working harder on this project was that if, you know, if T acts trivially on a stack, the fixed stack is just a stack. So that's, you know, that's how it works for schemes. But that's not true here. Okay. So again, if my curves were stable, well, then there's no non trivial actions of T on them because they have finite amorphism groups. But if they're not, if they have like some little P1, unstable P1, then I can let my torus act on there. And that gives you some new kind of exotic connected component of this fixed stack MGT that's parameterizing those things with, with the torus action. Okay, I mean- So you, Tom- Yeah. Why, why didn't this example make you decide that your definition of fixed, uh, of fixed points of a stack was wrong? Oh, well, it's not my definition. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but anyway, I, I guess the reason what I finally came to this, I, like I said, I've given talks about this project for a few years and I never, I didn't even understand this even then. And I said, oh, you need to look at this funny gadget where you associate to your stack. You look at Homs from BT in there and you should think of it as being kind of like a fixed stack because it behaves in many ways like a fixed stack. And I finally found out that it just literally is a fixed stack. Okay. And the fixed stack has this crazy, um, has this crazy property that again, it has, okay. Okay, so I'll just hit that. And let me give that, let me just tell you how this works out for a quotient stack. I'm taking too long, I apologize. I'm not gonna get, oh, okay. So, <laughs> let me, so if I wanna tell you what happens for quotient stacks, then I need to show you how to give a T action on a quotient stack. So there's a simple one, but I'm gonna give the complicated one because understanding this really lets you understand everything you wanna know about the fixed stack, okay? So how do I get an action of a torus on a quotient? What you wanna have is you wanna have an extension of groups, okay? So you could, Again, the simple cases where this is a product, I could take G2 will be G cross T, okay? but any extension will work. And if I have an action of G twiddle on some space M, okay, well then of course G X on M also, and then you get an induced action of T on the quotient. Okay, so again, you can think about this for sets or something and it's fine, you know, how do I let T act on an element in M on G? I just choose a pre-image of T up here and I let that act. Of course, that depends on the choice, but not once I mod out by G. So you need to be careful to make sure that this works for stacks and everything, but this is in Romani's uh, paper. He, he's, he talks about more than just the fixed stack, he talks about group actions. And this is a nice construction. And this is, I don't know, this would be a good way to get an action of some group on a quotient stack. Okay, so if I have this data, I have an extension of groups and I look at this, um, you know, I have this thing, what is the fixed stack you know, of the induced T action on here? And I'll just tell you what it is. Um, I take a direct sum over splittings. I look at every way to split this sequence. So again, if this is a product, that would just be maps from T to G. Okay. But in general, I look so, at splittings. So, so even the case when, I, I, sorry, this is, even when T is a finite group, and you, I mean, you have a finite group in the stack, I feel like this is gonna cause. Absolutely, yes. It's even, and that will it's cause you trouble group. for Deline Mumford stacks, because you'll have interesting maps from that finite group to those, those stabilizer groups. Yes, yeah, so in some ways, finite groups are worse. Right. 
Yes. But absolutely. you said the lean Mumford stacks, it's actually not. So, oh, you said tori on lean Mumford stacks. Yeah, so I, I'm, my it's group is always called T, and it's not always just a symbol. Some things are only true for tori. Um, in right. particular, this statement is only true for tori. Okay, this looks like it should always be true, but um, tori are very special. I mean, they've got a lot of good properties that most groups don't have. Um, so, um, yeah, so if I look at the fixed stack, anyway, I'll just, here's just a formula. You just look at all the splittings. Once I have a splitting of this map, then I get an action of T on M, you know, by composing with the action of G twiddle on M. I can look at the fixed locus of that, and then I can mod out by this kind of subgroup of G that acts there, the centralizer of, of, of B. Um, and so here you can see, well, I don't know, maybe it's hard to see looking at it quickly. Um, if, um, you know, if my group G is abelian or something, then in at least each component of XT will be mapping in um, as a kind of as a closed substack. Um, and, and you'll see the map is, is unramified. Um, and you also see here in this example, at least, these things are algebraic stacks. They're in fact, they're quotient stacks. Okay, you get an explicit description of them as, as quotient stacks. Um, and just as a sub example, again, just to see how terrible this is in some ways, if I just let T act trivial on BG, so I take a point mod G and I let T act on it, okay, that falls into this category. I can let my extension be T cross G, that, that also acts on a point. Um, then what I get is the fixed locus of this thing is, again, it's a disjoint unit over conjugate classes of maps from B to G, of sorry, of my torus into this group of, well, point mod the centralizer of that thing. Okay. So right um, now I'm thinking of, in this example, I want to think of G as being like, I guess like GL or something like that. Where yeah, for example, for example, Robbie, we could take G oh, to be PGL2, okay? And then you'd, then you'd get something that fits into the framework of the previous example. So PGL2, I can think of as like the automorphism of P1. So if I have like an unlabeled P1, um, so then BG would sit as like an open subsec of M0. And you see inside there, you'll get a copy of like BGM um, coming from if I take like, you know, zero T, I take like, sorry, that doesn't, work. oh, that works, yeah. Okay, I take like a diagonal copy of my torus inside here. Um, and that's just gonna correspond to this thing. I can look at a, a P1, I can let GM act on it. And now the automorphisms of that kind of curve with an action is just the GM. Um, and so that's that's a point in my, in my thing. So these examples are- So you've got like countably many, like is that right? You have countably yeah, many- Yeah, absolutely, things. yes, right. So it's, yes. So the fixed thing is countably, it's not even- It's like it's countably- not type anymore, yeah, it explodes. That's like horrible, okay. And th <laughs> but then you're, uh, uh, but then the previous thing you also said was that at least in some examples, you can understand the fixed stack as quotient. So in those cases, life is good. Like, like your thing at least is- It's still infinitely many though. I mean, there's still, there's, there can be a lot yeah. of morphisms. But at least they're algebraic stacks. At least they're- Yeah, each, one, each piece is an algebraic, each, you know, and, and they're separate pieces. So that's fine. I mean, that's pretty good. It's like, yeah. it's an algebraic stack and it's, each piece is a quotient stack. Uh, oh, I don't hear you anymore, Ravi. I'm sorry. I don't want to integrate things over uh, over something with infinitely many components because that now. Yeah, of course, but we're not going to need we're not going to need all the components. Uh, yeah. So yes. Um, yeah, and the warning which you already asked me about this thing doesn't in general does not have to be an algebraic stack. And there's already an example. Um, if I look at the modulus of his curves of genus one, um, it, it fail. It's close. You know, I don't. I haven't tried to work this out. I mean, I think maybe these things are like int or pro stacks. I mean, you get some phenomenon with it. I think they satisfy most of the Arden axioms, but maybe not. Not all of them. So, um, and uh, and also in this example, if T was not a torus, um, again, this thing isn't quite true. And again, they're not algebraic. If I let like the additive group act trivially on the classifying on B G M, that thing is not algebraic stack. Okay, but the additive group's a crazy group. Right? That's barely. A yeah, group. of course it is, but you know, it's a billion. <laughs> How bad can it really be? Um, okay, so I think I've said enough here to at least be able to state um, kind of the main theorem that I want to get to. So the setup, uh, and again, this is kind of a standard setup in like Cromwell Witten theory, is you have your moduli space, which is a Lean Mumford stack, and it's maybe nice, it's probably like a proper Lean Mumford stack, although not always, and it comes with a T equivariant morphism to some Arden stack. So again, the example I, I usually have in mind is I look at the moduli space of stable maps, and I forget the map and remember the underlying curve. And there's this Arden stack that, that parameterizes those. And it's easier to understand the deformation theory maybe relative to the space. So you get a, a perfect obstruction theory. And so this is some uh, terrible part of any talk about virtual classes. Um, there's this um, obstruction theory and it's given by some two-term composite vector models mapping to this relative cotangent complex. Okay. And, that, and there's some conditions on which amount is saying there's some cone 
Okay, the, the normal cone of this map, which is a cone stack, and it's embedding into a vector bundle stack, which is like this E1 mod E0 over here. Um, and really to understand even the statement here, you need to think about this virtual machinery um, in the way that uh, Christina Manalaki explains in her, in her thesis, which is what this gives you is not just a virtual class on M, what it really gives you is a virtual pullback. You have a way to pull back cycles from Y um, to M. And usually what you do is you pull back the fundamental class. This Y is some pure dimensional stack. It's got a fundamental class and you pull it back and that's the thing you call the virtual fundamental class. But I'm gonna to need to use this, you know, this whole machine where you can pull back other classes from Y um, using the data of this cone inside a vector model stack. And again, this is just like folded intersection theory. If you can embed a normal cone into a vector model stack to a vector bundle, you know, then you can pull back classes. So that's, that's how this goes. And the nice thing, um, and the reason why I said that stuff about um, relating the, Kind of residue map that you get from the localization theorem in terms of cones is now that's in terms of cones and vector bundles. This is in terms of cones and vector bundles. So they play well together, these two um, kind of theories. Um, okay, so when when y is a point, okay, then the, um, the old virtual virtual localization theorem that I proved with Rahul um, was that I look at the fixed locus. So I have M, you know, it's the same setup, but it's just mapping to a point. And so this L is the absolute cotangent complex. Um, then the thing that's true is I look at the fixed locus and that's also got a perfect obstruction theory given by taking the invariant part of E. So just like you take the invariant part of the tangent bundle of M, you get the tangent bundle of the fixed locus. Here I take the, the same thing kind of virtually. I take this virtual tangent bundle, which is this E and I take the fixed part. And then if I wanna know what's the class on the fixed locus that pushes forward to the virtual fundamental class of M, well, I take that virtual fundamental class on the fixed locus, Okay, that comes from this, this obstruction theory you get, and you hit it with the Euler class of what well, I call the virtual normal bundle, which is the rest. You know, I have this two-term complex E. Here I took the fixed part. The rest is the moving part, and that should be what I think of it as the normal bundle. So that's, that's the formula. In the relative case, it's more complicated because what I get is the MT is not sort of virtually smooth. It doesn't have its perfect obstruction theory in some absolute sense, and it also does not have one relative to Y. It has one relative to YT. So I have M mapping to Y. If everything's equivariant, then the fixed stack here maps to the fixed stack here. And when I take the invariance of E, um, that gives me uh, a relative obstruction theory for this map. So MT is mapping. Um, okay, so, 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 so at this point, M what, to Y, our hypotheses were that Y was, Y, I forgot we had an M to Y, but now MT and okay. YT, these guys aren't even algebraic stacks. They are stacks. Oh, oh sorry. So, MT yeah, okay. is fine. So like MT that. is fine. MT is a closed, is it, because M is W Mumford and T is a torus, this is just a closed substack of M. I'm, so I'm, of course, I don't have my technical hypotheses. I'm going to assume that my YT is algebraic, or at least the part of it that MT maps to is algebraic. Okay. So that happens in every example that I know, but it doesn't have to. You can certainly right. build so, examples. So, so YT is hideous, but because MT is nice, it, is, it hits only. It hits only finally many things. Well, I'm not saying that actually. I'm not saying that always happens. I'm just going to no, assume it. The situation you might hope for. <laughs> yeah. So I think it would be interesting, but I definitely I've taken way too long already to write this paper, and uh, I think even when it's not algebraic, it's probably close enough that everything I'm going to say makes sense and is true. And I think there's some theory there that's very similar to this work of Emerton and G about kind of images of, of stacks under, under morphisms. You know, this thing is close to being algebraic. But anyway, my hypothesis, I guess I did write it down here in very small print eventually. It's gonna be that I'm, I'm not gonna deal with the non-algebraic parts of, of YT. Um, okay. And so what I, want, what I want to do to state this thing, there's gonna be a natural class alpha, okay? That's in sort of some localized Chow group of this fixed locus. And I'm gonna get it just by doing that. Again, YT is a Arden stack, you know, that map of, um, from the YT to Y, it's not even necessarily a proper map. And it's definitely, I'm not gonna have a localization theorem that tells me that the Chow groups here are the same as the Chow groups of Y, but I can do the analogous construction to, of the residue that, that holds here. I can just take that normal cone of YT and Y and take those things that I called the segregate classes before, okay? Um, and I can, I can define that thing to be an alpha. So at this point, you lost even your localization theory. Like, like earlier, you had uh, for arbitrarily horrible things you got localization theory, and then the yeah, so arbitrarily horrible schemes, schemes you have it for, for stacks. You've lost your localization, but you're trying to get the residue. To make sense. I just want to yeah. So if this y, so if I wanted to 
if I wanted to write this theorem when y is Dilly Mumford, then I would just put here the usual residue. Uh, this alpha that I'm going to define it would just be the usual residue. I, everything would look nice. Um, and the point is here, I can really do the same thing. I just have to interpret that residue map in terms of this cone in a vector bundle um, business. Okay. Um, and so I get this class alpha, which I think of as being the class that kind of pushes forward to the fundamental class of y. And I pull that back by this map. I do this virtual pull back here. And then I just hit the thing with the virtual element. So the theorem ends up looking almost the same. I just, I have this, this, this little class alpha on the base okay, that, that plays a role here, um, and which is some work to, to, to get at. So, um, so that's the theorem. And again, there's some, there are some technical hypotheses. Again, I want, again, I want this U to be algebraic. I'm going to empty the YT to factor through some open algebraic substack. And again, to define these segregate classes, I use some kind of embedding of my cone in a vector bundle. So I'd like to have that, or at least have that after some proper base change. So there's some, again, I tried to do this as, as generally as I could, um, and at least generally enough to handle the example that I, that I have in mind. So in the last like eight minutes, I can tell you about that example and what, um, what kind of things you see when you just try and um, apply this theorem there. Um, okay, so, so are there questions about the theorem? I, pro I probably lost people at the last second there. But I mean, I should say, before you start on the theorem, you know that there's an answer, okay? Again, you, on M, okay, on your moduli space, it's Lee Mumford, you have a localization theorem there. There's some class that pushes forward to the virtual fundamental class. It's just a question of identifying it, okay? So um, that really works in your favor here. And I'm just saying you can give it a name. It involves, as you know, the ingredients that you need to understand are there's this normal bundle, which is the moving part of the obstruction theory. And there's this class alpha on, on the base. Um, it comes from some kind of normal cone type construction. So let me just make sure to see what, so on why lots of things are crazy and yet somehow the things you need to make sense of going back to M, you can make sense of everything that you need. Is that, and so- That's what I'm saying, yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. Yeah, so. And I should say in particular examples, it can be easier to understand this, uh, this, this Y, T, and Y, and, and this L. You don't necessarily need to use deformation to the normal cone to, to talk about it. And, and that is the case in, in the example log stable maps. So if I, if I can say so, I'll try to explain it. But um, can I ask a question? Yeah. But here the Y, T could be very bad, right? Because the Y is actually the Arden stack. So the Y, T cannot be like an algebraic stack, right? It might not be an algebraic stack. But so again, my hypothesis is going to be that it is. Oh, okay, I see. I, I, see. I don't. I do not know how to, to prove things when um, when the, at least if the MT you know maps to non-algebraic parts of YT. I don't know. I don't know how to prove anything there. Although again, my suspicion is that a similar statement is true, but it would be a lot of work. Maybe not worth it. To, you know, okay. to just Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, Okay, so let's see. So yeah, so log stable maps. So yeah, so this is some generalization of stable maps. If you have a log smooth scheme, then you get a, a moduli space that parameterizes kind of log maps to, to X. And it's actually not so easy to say what the functor of points of that stack is in the category of schemes. There's a kind of a technical point that makes it hard, but for log schemes, it's great. This is really a, a gadget that lives most happily in kind of logarithmic algebraic geometry. So if you have a scheme with a log structure, then a map to this space, which I'll just call M, is a log smooth curve over that base and a log morphism from, from C to X, which is stable as a map, as a kind of underlying map of, of schemes. Okay, so um, again, a log smooth curve over some base S looks like to us, like the flat family of nodal curves over, over ordinary scheme, but with some funny data about these, these monoids. So this moduli space, it's some uh, properly Mumford stack with, you know, with the log structure on there. And then and this is the whole point of why it's related to what I said before, this M, it comes with a perfect obstruction theory, but not relative to a smooth base, relative to point, but relative to a singular base, which you know, call Y. And what is that? Um, anytime you have a, a stack with log structure, it comes, you can interpret that log structure as a map to this classifying stack of log structures, so introduced by Olson, and that's really my Y. And you don't need to use that whole thing. Y has these kind of finite type approximations. Um, with, what this Y looks like is it's like a torque variety modulo the action of its torus. Okay, so. So, so it's not, it's not, you can't make it like the torque stacky guy, that whose core space is, is the, 
is the torque variety. But you can't map it to a smooth arm stack instead of. No, yeah, right. It's, it's singular. Yeah, it's going to be a singular torque variety um, in general. Right, but it doesn't map to the thing mapping to that single torque variety. Oh, yeah, right. It only maps to the quotient. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? It maps to the stack quotient, that's the right, torque that's right. module of the torus. Yeah. And you know, the torque variety you glue together by taking cones and sticking them together along faces inside some ambient lattice. These things, these kind of Ys that you get here, um, you get by doing the same kind of gluing, but there's no ambient lattice. So I have two cones, and if I can match up a face. But, um, but, but that's OK. I guess what I mean is like U itself is something it is like coarsely smooth. It's, it's a coarse thing or something of like a, something smooth mod something smooth. Oh, it I see what you're saying. Quotient. I can realize this thing has a quotient. I don't know. I have never thought about. Uh, and, and then the entire thing does glue together as well as you want. But yes. It's smooth, but it's uh, maybe. I think you wanna, yeah, but right. That's a funny thing where you were kind of working in the world of stacks, but then you want to take that quotient not quite as a stack quotient, but as a. No, as a stack quotient. Or, well, then it would be smooth. So then it's not yeah. going to work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not gonna work. Okay. So you're saying this is the wrong thing. Okay. That would be the wrong thing. Yeah. I don't want that smooth thing. I want this. Uh, the whole, in some sense, the whole point of the of the log geometry is to like allow these kind of. Oh, you're hardwiring it. In. You're right. It's forced into the. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That, that's yeah. That's the point of this game is that you get this kind of control over the singularities coming from this. Um, okay. So uh, so what's going to happen if I try to? I'm just going to quickly say what. You know, what are the things that come up when you try to apply that theorem here? So you're going to want to identify this yt inside y. And so if I have a torque variety, again, that's a global quote, and locally, HL locally, or practically globally, you can write this thing as a quotient. So that description I gave before um, is going to apply. So what I'm going to see is this y is a torque variety. My torus, of course, there's now two tori in play. There's the torus of that torque variety, and there's my torus. But I'm going to get a homomorphism near a point of here. There's going to be some associated map from my torus into that torus, a homomorphism. And my thing is going to look like the fixed locus. I look inside that torque variety. I've got the sub torus acting. That's got some fixed locus, which is at least as a, as a set, it's just some kind of union of torus orbits. There's only finally many of them. So how bad could it be? Um, anyway, that's, that's in there. So that's my, that's my YT. It just looks like some kind of union of toric sub varieties of, of my torus. So you can kind of understand it, but I don't know. And then the question you'd want to do to find that class alpha. So you could ask this in full generality. If I have a toric variety V and just a sub torus, can we compute just the, this kind of toric residues? Um, again, the, you, can, you can just work globally. On, you don't need to work in some stacky way. I can just look on that toric variety. I have this kind of smaller torus acting and I can try to do localization for that torus on this thing. And that, that's some totally explicit question in toric geometry. Um, that I don't know how to answer. I mean, it's, this is complicated already for the full torus, where there's just a isolated fixed points, and you want to know what are those uh, residues. It's it's not like a trivial thing to calculate in theory, okay, but not at all in practice. You can definitely calculate these. You just resolve the singularities of your toric variety, and then do it up on the smooth thing where we have like that plot residue theorem. Okay, so you can do it by subdividing um, your cones into polyhedral cones. So in theory, you can do that. So I'm going to treat that as a black box, okay, how to find those alphas. But the one thing you can say, again, on a toric variety, the chow, the intersection theory is pretty well understood, you know, cycles on there, it's just, there's the torus invariant cycles, okay, so we, those cycle classes, and then there's these cohomology classes, they're like the weights of the torus and stuff. And I know the cohomology classes are easy to pull back, so you really, to understand that class alpha, it's just about really understanding toric strata. And um, for this space, it's a pretty fun toric variety that you're going to look at. Okay, so if I take x, my target to let's say be a toric variety, okay, um, then you know that toric variety's got some fan. Okay, so here I've drawn the fan for p1 cross. <laughs> my uh, high tech graphics are coming into view now. Thank you. Um, so here's like the fan for p1 cross p1. So if I look at maps there, what am I going to see? I'm going to get some tropical curve in the fan. Okay, so you can draw. People who know about tropical geometry, there's, you know, you draw some kind of vertices and they're mapping to lattice points in this lattice, and you have maybe some edges between them. And then these are like marked points or these blue lines going off to infinity. And there's some balancing condition at each um, point here. There's some outgoing vectors that have to add up to zero. Okay, so I don't definitely cannot explain this in any more detail now, but um, I can look at the modulated space of these things. You know, if I fix the slopes of all the lines in question um, and I fix kind of which uh, cone each red dot maps to, then the set of things like this is itself a cone. And that's the cone that's the base. You know, the torque variety associated with that cone is the one you see in the base. And if I'm at the fixed locus, there's some constraints on what this thing can look like. 
and you can identify exactly which are the fixed things in there. It's, um, that's kind of straightforward. Um, okay, so you get a really explicit description here of this inclusion of this yt into y. It has to do with certain tropical curves inside the set of all tropical curves inside M. And so again, you could try then in principle to write down this class alpha. I definitely do not know how to do that in general. For the simplest examples, it's not hard, but it would not be long before I, you know, the way I do this, you know, is actually find generators for these cones. And that would be like trying to study the moduli space of curves by trying to embed it in projective space and write down the equations, right? That's not, that's not what you're supposed to do. But that's the only way I really know how to go about um, studying this thing. Okay, and so the last step, sorry, I'll just say one last thing. If I, if I want an, if I solve that problem, either in general or in some example, I'd have some class alpha and I need to pull it back and look at this virtual class you get on this moduli space. And you wanna identify it in terms of things that you understand. Um, and for that, there's two, there's two steps. One thing is you'd like to first decompose this into pieces. Um, so maybe, you know, here inside this cone, I have some piece. And this is kind of a fun thing that you can do. Um, in general, it's hard to, the thing that's annoying about logarithmic geometry and these log stable maps is I'm used to the fact that if I wanna give a map from like a curve, a nodal curve to something, I can look at the normalization. You get a map from the normalization, you just ask that the points agree. But for a, for a log curve, there's some extra data at the node. You can't just kind of rip it apart so easily. So here to decompose, um, to kind of coarsely decompose, you can instead break it into open pieces. And usually you don't want to look at um, spaces of maps from non-compact curves, but if you look at equivariant maps, um, it's okay here. So you can, you can at least kind of coarsely break this thing up into pieces of which are mapping just to one cone. Um, and then what you'll see there, okay, finally, you know, when I look at what actual cohomology classes or child classes on the moduli space of curves, and I'm gonna end up seeing when I look here, um, I get these things that are like these double ramification strata. So if I, if I look here, you know, this, this vertex is gonna to correspond to some curve mapping to a point in my toric variety. And these three things coming off are gonna be three marked points on there. And what's gonna be required for this thing to be a log stable map is that some equations hold among those points thought of as elements in the Picard group. I'm gonna have some, um, I'm gonna be asking some line bundle associated to a divisor um, to be trivial. And you know, depending on the dimension of my toric variety, I'm gonna to ask several line bundles to, to be trivial. So I'll get some um, these cycles in the modular space of curves modulus of pointed curves defined by these conditions. Yeah, sorry. Oh, just in that picture, just help me parse that picture. So you said that's the cone of P1 cross P1. Is that the black part is the cone? Oh yeah, sorry, P1 the black part P1? is, yeah. The black part is the so, fan P1 cross P1. And so these red dots would correspond to like um, irreducible components of my curve. And so this red okay. dot, this, so this big cone, that corresponds to a fixed point. You, you realize when you're pointing to your screen, I can't actually tell what you're doing. <laughs> yes, okay, so this red guy here. Yeah. Um, he's like, a, he's corresponds, so let me draw. Over here, I have my P1 cross P1, right? And it's got these four fixed points. Yeah. So, so basically just tropical, kind of tropical as everything. So yeah, this picture is a tropical. tropicalization of your curve, but uh, maybe that's not quite enough. Maybe Jim would like me to actually tell him what that means in this example. <laughs> so, um, if I look at a stable, you know what a fixed map to P1 cross P1 looks like, right? I have some curves that are contracted to those fixed points and I have some P1s that are mapping to those um, edges, yep. maybe. And, and this is not a good picture because this is a picture of like a general curve. But so these red dots, those correspond to the contracted components. These edges are the nodes that, that are joining them. And these, these blue lines are just the mark points on, on my curve. And they come and, with, and the, you know, the red easy. one, the red dot that is actually on the axes, yes. what is, that, that, that means what? Be, that could be one of these P1s. So, so this, that's actually covering the P1. The other ones actually sit and sit and yeah. map to the fixed point. Is that the idea? Yes. Yeah, so in fact, this particular tropical curve that I've written here could not be the tropical curve of a fixed uh, one because it's got these two things. This is, this is supposed to be mapping like to this fifth point, and this is supposed to be mapping to this fixed point. Um, and so how could they possibly have a node joining them? So I should put in like another, right. another one here, and this would be like the oh. P1. Um, yeah, actually, yeah. Okay. See, you it, need a bunch of those points, don't yeah, you? Yeah, we need a bunch of them. In fact, I, yes, I absolutely would. In fact, this, this, this drawing is sort of nonsensical. You could say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you were mean-spirited, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this uh, so th these are the kind of drawings you see. And people who study, you know, tropical geometry, they 
they'd love to draw these tropical curves. And they talk about this modular space of tropical curves. And that's this kind of combinatorial gadget that encodes all these possible um, geometries. And these slopes of these angles, those are going to correspond in this language to imposing like tangency conditions along these, these vertices. So the fact that it's going up at this angle would say maybe it's got equal tangency along this line and, and this line. So it all gets encoded in, in this gadget. Um, and again, on that contracted curve, then um, you know you have this balancing condition is going to tell you that when I add up the kind of some, some coefficients of these three points, they add up to zero. So it defines the degree zero line bundle. The refined thing that you get when you look at the moduli space of log stable maps is that degree zero line bundle actually has to be trivial. So that's a condition in the moduli space of curves. And so you do see these kind of interesting cycles in MGN bar, um, and really so, most naturally so this, is, so this is some generalization of the double. Like you're saying. You're requiring that some combination of points, linear combination of points, is zero in the part of it. Or it sounds like more, you're requiring a chosen isomorphism with it being uh, the trivial bundle. Uh, 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 because, uh, I, and, uh, or maybe that's the point. That, that's not the point question. I mean, it's very, yeah. like, if I did this for P1 so that my fan was one dimensional and then it's hard to draw a tropical curve, then you really get exactly the double ramification cycle here. Right. But if you, but, but the P1 cross P1, now you're going to have two conditions. Yeah, exactly. You get two conditions. And, and then you might think, well, I want this line bundle to be zero and I want this line bundle to be zero. So I intersect those two cycles. But if, again, if you, you know, looking at this work being done by people like uh, Dhruv and like David Holmes and, uh, Johannes Schmidt, um, there's kind of a refined product that, that, that happens on some blow up. And it has to do with the fact that it's not so easy to compactify those cycles. You know, when you ask a, a line bundle to be trivial, it's when you degenerate into boundaries, something interesting happens. And that has a real tropical interpretation. Uh, and so these pictures are very similar to the pictures you'll see in like Marcus and Wise's paper, understanding the double ramification cycle in terms of tropical. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going way over time. So maybe I should let people go if they want to uh, watch Ted Lasso. <laughs> Oh, is that out? Yeah, it's out today. Yeah, I, I wait till the end of my talk to mention. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, would he done? I'm done. I mean, go. Is, that, is, that, is that a sudden? Is that a sudden end? Is that you? I, I didn't mean to actually force this. No, it's good. It's good. It's okay, good. great. I'm like in that case, let us stop and uh, our meters off.